Good morning. Welcome to Trinity's second traditional service, second service. Uh, boy, we're having some beautiful weather this week. We need a little rain, but the farmers are liking it because it's dry and not too hot and getting all the corn and beans in, and that's a good thing. Uh, services are no services tonight, and they've got what they call October Super Sunday coming up the 16th. We'll talk about that more a little later on, but it's an outdoor event. Sounds pretty good with all the things going on there. And, uh, you know, uh, Norma had been remodeled and having our bathroom remodeled. And I wasn't, I was not for it. One thing was money, but uh, she just, she has, she's paid that much. She paid a long way. But anyway, Shower, she had to have a walk-in shower, and I'm used to the slide and go or sitting, you know, and that's what I like. Well, she, not done by no means, but Chase and Summer took off to Florida this week, so he got it fixed where we could actually use the walk-in shower like she wanted. And she said, I want you to go first last night. So I went in, and it was an experience, and I come out, and she said, how was it? I said, well, it's a lot bigger than my shower, and it's so open, and uh, I felt like I was taking a shower in the street somewhere. It's wide open, <laughs> and then it's not. Uh, there's not no cover in there. It's wide open too, so it's going to take some adjustment on my part. And I can tell you that. So let's go ahead and. <laughs> What'd you say, Karen? Thank you. Thank you for that picture. Thank you. <laughs> So I don't know if you got I don't know if you got to walk in or not. So think about that. All right, let's get a service opening with our acolytes, and the kids are not here, so it's left up to the elderly gentleman. <laughs> Stand with me. We have today's verses. We're going back to Matthew, Matthew 7. And these words here are Jesus is speaking to us. As he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. And Father, we thank you for the beautiful day you've given us. We thank you for the good turnout we have with the kids and the fellowship and the East on Holmes Bend. Had a wonderful time, wonderful experience. Thank you for that. Thank you for everything you do for us. Be with Brother Steve as he brings our message today. I ask this in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing and sing together, oh, for a thousand times.
bring the glory in. Feel free to clap or dance in the aisles if you want to.
pray together. Father, you are so good to us. Your mercy, your grace, your kindness, your provision. There is an abundance with you, an abundance, no shortage. And we ask you to pour out your spirit on our hearts here in the sanctuary and those watching at home. Pour out your spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask for you. And Jesus said, if we ask for you, you will be given to us. That if we go looking for you, we will find you. That if we knock on the door where you are, it'll be opened and we will receive you. We, we believe the word and we believe, Holy Spirit, you are being refreshed in us now, given to us now. <coughs> Hallelujah. Father, in your presence, in your presence, there is peace. In your presence, the psalmist says, there is joy. Joy. Oh, give us the joy of our salvation. If there is a heaviness on anyone, God, would you take off that heaviness and give us the garment of praise. Give us that robe of joy. We do belong to Jesus by his grace, we are saved through our faith in him, his cross, his resurrection, and we will be with him forever in glory. We believe that, we know it, and we thank you for it. And God, as we pray, I'm with Sam, I thank you for that, that hayride and fish fry Wednesday night, the music and the message, it was so good to be with your people and with you outside. Father, it got completely dark. Not a light on in that pavilion, but that didn't stop us. We still talked, sang, and, and heard your word. Thank you for your creation, the beautiful lake. And thank you for the beautiful creation of your church. Your church. God, we lift up our brothers and sisters that may be struggling. We lift up Bradley Bradshaw's family for your comfort and love. We lift up Sandy Powell's friend, Ron, for your help in healing serious cancer. We lift up Jenny LaJoy for your help. We lift up Kelly Stevens for your help. These two are really struggling. We ask for your peace, your power to come to them and their families and carry them. And God, we lift up your church that we will be who you are, transforming us to be. The people will see you in us. They will come to you. They will know you, and you will be glorified. Jesus, thank you. In your name we pray. And now if you're near someone and comfortable, let's join hands as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, you may be seated. Let me ask the ushers to come forward. Let us give our tithes and offerings.
It's good to have Nancy back on stage. And we got birthdays coming up this week, but we're going to celebrate them next Sunday because they're later. And an anniversary. Heavenly Father, we come to you to ask your blessings on these tithes. They're with the, the tithes for your bounty that always, we hope, glorifies your name, helps your people, and keeps your church doors open. We ask this in your holy name again. Amen. Welcome. Hello to your neighbor. be honest with you, after that doxology, Sam, you had a hard act to follow. Boy, I, I'm, that was, we've done some doxologies before, but now that was, that was a good one. I, I believe that's the difference. <laughs> I believe. Yeah, she, that, 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 it, that, and the Lord deserves every bit of it. And, and, and if we couldn't sing a lick, and we sang, still sang, Praise God from whom all blessings flow off key. He would love it. But it sure is fun for the body when it's, when it's pretty. Charlene, you on undergirding that piano on Thy Word is a Lamp Unto My Feet. Now that's some good stuff. Takes me back to the 80s. That's beautiful, beautiful. All right. Our message, don't trouble the master anymore. And I confess it did change a word. You would be used to hearing that as don't trouble the teacher anymore. But they found out he's more than a teacher. And so we're going to call him the master, what he is today, Jesus, our master. I opened the early service. It's a little less formal there, but I think you all could go with me on this one. Did any of you all watch any football yesterday? All right. You all going to watch any football today? Okay. All right. It's full-blown football season. Um, so... If the quarterback goes up to the center and starts calling out numbers, we don't know what they are. We don't know what they are. It's something like this. 849, 849, 849, 850. Hut, and you go. Now what did I just do? I just gave you Luke 849. Let's stand and read one verse. Luke 849. And all the action happens on eight, Luke 850. So here's 849. Jesus has just healed the woman. And now this, this messenger comes while he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. Don't trouble the master anymore. Did the person really have to say that? Here, they're bringing the worst news Jairus could ever hear. And they add a comment to it. Jairus, your daughter is dead. That's all they had to say. Jairus' heart sinks. His hopes are gone. His daughter didn't make it. But the messenger, and Luke uses the word, the someone, has to add... Oh, and, and do not trouble the master anymore either. Why? Why would someone say that? Here's Jairus, has just lost his 12-year-old daughter, and someone is telling him to stay away from Jesus when Jesus is the person he needs the most. Whether or not Jesus raised the daughter Jesus is the person Jairus needed the most as his heart is breaking. He needed Jesus' comfort and Jesus' support. But someone comes along and says, 
don't trouble the master anymore. Don't trouble the master. Don't bother the master anymore. Distance from him. Drift away from him. Mm -mm -mm. That statement smells. It doesn't smell good. Anyone, someone comes to draw you away from Jesus. Don't bother the master anymore. What does that statement imply? They didn't say it, or if they said it, Luke didn't write it. What does it imply when this someone says, do not trouble the, the master anymore? It implies th there's nothing the master can do. There's nothing Jesus can do. Your daughter is dead. They know that. You don't have to say it. And last of all, was it true? Don't trouble the master anymore. There's nothing he can do. Was that true? No. 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 How did someone know that? Someone didn't know. They did. Have you ever had someone talk to you who didn't know? In the last 20 minutes? <laughs> sure, all the time. I say things that I don't know about to Karen. She says them to me. We say them to each other. I didn't know that. I didn't know dogs can't have avocados. Did you know that? I didn't know that. This person didn't know big things. Didn't know Jesus. This word for trouble in the English when I read, do not trouble the teacher anymore, I, I interpret that to mean it's all over, don't bother him. Politely, don't bother him. He's taking care of the woman. He tried to take care of your daughter. He's got other people waiting for him. Don't bother him. But guess what, church? It doesn't mean that. It's a much more severe word in the Greek. What Luke wrote... And Luke is a very intelligent man under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He wrote the, the verb skulos, skulo, which is the verb. Well, Sam, unfortunately, would understand this better than the rest of us or some of you that hunt. Skulo in Greek means to skin alive, to cause such irritation and pain and torment as to skin something alive to trouble an animal by skinning it alive. And it figuratively means to extremely annoy or harass someone, to irritate them to the point of aggravation. Why is that verb there? Luke, why, is, why did you write that? Why did someone say that? What it really interprets is, Jairus, your daughter is dead. Don't harass the master anymore which has either two possible interpretations. Jairus had been harassing Jesus. You've got to come heal my daughter. You've got to heal my daughter. I'm the synagogue ruler. You've got to heal my daughter, which we don't get from the context. Or, Jairus, don't harass the master anymore. Make sure you leave Jesus alone. Make sure you get away from Jesus so you don't irritate him. It's a strong word for a strong deterrent to deter Jairus from following Jesus. Why? Why is it in there? That's not a good word. That's not a, that's not a good news. If we look at this eight, Luke 8 section, we're going to find the enemy approaching, the enemy of our Lord. Now, he doesn't come, he's not named. He's just sensed. He's identified. And church, I propose to you, this sentence is a little leak from the enemy. Someone came and told Jairus, your daughter is dead. Now leave the master alone. Don't trouble the master. Don't harass the master. Just let it be. Why? Why would Satan want Jairus to drift away from Jesus? The second time that voice appears is in this same context when Jesus goes to Jairus' house. 
he, he walked in or walks under the property and says, the girl is sleeping. She's not dead. What did Luke write then? Did he write, and they all just shrugged their shoulders and said, she's dead? No. He wrote, and they scorned Jesus. They mocked him. They made fun of what he said. So what did he do? You are not going to see the miracle. He put them all out. Everybody out of the house. I just need Jairus and his wife, and I need Peter, James, and John. Everybody else out. Why? Unbelief from this someone, and unbelief all over those someones in the house. They never once thought that Jesus could raise the girl from the dead. So they made fun of him. They mocked him. Now, who is it that mocks us? That's Satan. I mean, he's behind it, taunting us. How did Jesus react to Jairus when the someone came and said this? Did Jesus say, yeah, Jairus, that's right. Um, don't trouble me anymore. There's nothing I can do. Is that what Jesus said? What's 8.50? What's 8.50? Don't be afraid, Jairus. Believe. Believe and your daughter will be well. Don't be afraid. Believe and your daughter will be well. What did Jairus do? Did he stay away or did he follow close? <laughs> he grabbed Jesus' robes. Let's go. Let's go. Here's my house. Come right in. Jairus didn't stop for a moment because he so much wanted his daughter. Jesus didn't stop for a moment because he so much wanted to help Jairus. Jairus did not irritate Jesus. He did not bother him. That was a lie. Jesus loves to help us, welcomes our requests, welcomes our prayers. So someone missed the miracle, and all the someones missed the miracle, and the people who believed and the people who were being taught, the disciples, saw it. They saw the master call the spirit of this girl back to her body and raise her from the dead. Now, we all go, wow, how'd you ever see that coming? You never saw it coming. Church, a lot of Jesus' answers to our prayers, we're never going to see them coming. We are not going to predict it. We are not going to know it. It's not in our realm. We're in a Western, observable, measurable, sensible world. And we don't understand the supernatural. And even if we wanted to, we, we can't. To Jesus, raising the girl... To us, that's a miracle. Was that a miracle to Jesus? No. Not at all. He does, he, that's his realm. He is the son of the living God, the living and the creating God. It's not a miracle to him. It sure is to us. This whole pestering. Has someone ever pestered you to keep you, to keep you from church? to keep you from the word, to keep you from prayer, to keep you from singing. Has, anyone, has someone ever come up to you and said something that smelled like unbelief? Like there's no hope. There's nothing Jesus can do. There's nothing Jesus will do for you. It gets worse and worse. This troubling, this aggravating now, by this time of day, at the early service, I looked to the stream, and those of you watching on the stream, because I know about half our churches in Florida or down the Keys, I know where they are. They're all at Bob Evans having brunch. And so I just talked to them. If you're in Bob Evans or the Waffle House or Denny's or Cracker Barrel, and they may be for lunch now, Eastern time, it's lunchtime. So if you all are having lunch there, look around the restaurant, and is anybody schoolo their server, schooling their server. 
is anybody extremely irritating their server. Now, there's one way you can trouble your server politely. Could I trouble you for some more coffee? Or could I trouble you for some napkins? Could I trouble you for another serving of bacon? That's no problem. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the people who trouble their server. This coffee's cold. This coffee's old. This bacon's raw. This, this, this restaurant's too cold. This TV is the wrong channel. My seat is too firm. Blah, 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 blah. Guess how many servers want to wait on people like that? If they get to know that you're like that, and I was at the dollar store once, and the dollar store clerk knew someone who was like that, you know what they do? What I do? They run for the back room. Last server out has to wait on him. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh, I didn't make it. Because you extremely irritate the server. That's what skulo means. And that's what this someone is saying to Jairus. Jairus, don't extremely irritate the master. You, you are no good. You are, you are a burden. You have burdened the master. He doesn't want to hear from you. He doesn't want to be near you. He doesn't want to help you. And every bit of that is a lie. But the enemy is trying to keep Jairus from receiving a blessing. I'm seeing a miracle. How often has the enemy tried to hinder you from seeing a blessing? To distract you or delay you? Oh, he's good at it. He's good at it. You've got to heed that inner voice from the Holy Spirit. No, put that down and go do this. Whatever that means to fit in there. All right. Question. To know our Lord, so that, so that Jesus is properly known to us and to anybody who watches or talks to us. Is Jesus helpful or is he hard to approach? Is Jesus easy to approach or is he hard to approach? Is approaching Jesus like approaching the Wizard of Oz, the big flaming guy in the movie? He's not at all like that. Although some people would portray him that way, he's not. He is very approachable. Question number two, was there any time when Jesus walked the earth when he told someone who came to him with a genuine request, told them, I can't help you. I can't do that. I can't heal you. I can't deliver you. I can't provide you food. I can't give the rain. I can't calm the storm. I can't walk on the water. Did he ever say to someone who sincerely came to him, I can't help you? No. No. To the four guys who lowered the, their friend through the roof, tear up the guy's roof, the, the owner's roof, and lower a guy right in front of the whole assembly. Did Jesus become irritated by that? No. He went with the flow. He said, okay. But you'll know that the Son of Man can forgive sins. Take up your pallet and walk. <laughs> wow, that was another amazing moment too. The only time he said that he wouldn't deliver a daughter was when the woman who asked him was not Jewish. She was Gentile. Remember what he said to her? I am not sent to the Gentiles. I am only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And he at first told her he would not deliver her daughter from the demon. It wasn't that he couldn't do it. It's that he wasn't supposed to do it yet. Because those blessings were for Israel. But she, she took trouble to the good sense. She troubled him. He says, woman, these blessings are for the children, the children of Israel. And what did she say? You know what she said. Oh, master, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. He gave in. He caved your daughter's well. She had such faith in him and stayed with him. She persisted with him so much. And Luke wraps this up in chapter 18 when he writes, Jesus told a story of the widow who persisted with the judge. Judge, I need this fair treatment. I need this justice. I need you to rule this fairly. 
And she wore him out until finally he said, I don't care about this widow and I don't care about this judgment, but lest she wear me out or come and kill me, I'll give her what she's asking. And the whole point of that parable, Jesus is telling us to persist with the Father. Keep going to him. Don't back off and drift away. Mm -mm. Keep persisting. Now, once God knows your request, you can remind him, God, I've asked you this. Remember? Yes, I remember. God, are you working on it? Yes, I'm working on it. God, here's your word, what you say about it. I know my word. But you can have this dialogue with God every day. To persist until, until the answer comes. This account where Jesus actually had to resurrect the girl. That may have not have been on his plan for the day, but he did not disappoint Jairus. Jairus' heart was in Jesus' hand. Jairus, I won't disappoint you. Because I was delayed helping someone else, I will not disappoint you. And I hope we can hear Jesus say that to us. I will not disappoint you. And he doesn't. God is good. He is so good to us. But his timing is different than our timing. And his answer may be different than our request. Always better. Jairus asked Jesus to heal his daughter. Jesus raised her from the dead. I didn't think you could do that. There's things that are going to happen in your life. If you'll stay with Jesus, things will happen. I didn't think he could do that because we have little brains. He can do anything. He can do anything. Jesus can always do something. This is the good news. Jesus can always do something. If he doesn't change the circumstance, he can change your heart. It starts in the heart, and then he may very well change the circumstance. In the early service, Marcus Robinson was baptized today, church. He's about a seven-year-old boy. He's in a wheelchair, sweet as could be, fourth born of Anthony and Brittany Robinson. Came to Christ when we prayed for the students for school. He was right here, and, and the Lord said, ask him if he wants to accept right now, because I knew he wanted to. I talked to him. And so as we're praying for students, Marcus, do you want to accept Jesus now? Uh, he looked up at his mom and his sister, and they said, yes. He said, yes. He was shy. Well, today he was baptized. Baptized by pouring. We, he was too afraid of the baptistry. If your legs didn't work, you would not want to be in a big tub of water. So right here, we just poured the water over him with the tub and baptized him. He, and, and we began to pray for his healing. He may or may not be in that wheelchair all his life. Lord, you could heal him. Lord, you could bring him out of that wheelchair. And if that's the Father's will, he will bring him out of that wheelchair. Or if it's better for the kingdom of God and the spread of the gospel that Marcus is in the wheelchair, he'll be in the wheelchair. Lord, that's not what we're asking. But this is better for the kingdom. And we have to accept those kind of answers. Now in Luke 8.50, Jesus said to Jairus what he would do if Jairus would believe. Your daughter will be made well. Jesus said it and he kept his word. She was made well. So if Jesus tells you what he's going to do, he will do it. But if he doesn't tell you the answer yet, you have to watch and wait. This boils down to, to three steps. And the one before that word trouble, that word trouble, just take that home and think about that. But before we do that, we turn to the master. Someone was trying to get Jairus to turn away from the master. No. Turn to the master. He is very approachable. He is very understanding. And even if Jairus was a little annoying, Jesus knew why. His daughter's dying. Jesus knew that. That we may be patient with people who may be a little annoying. To ask, why, why are they like that, and try to help. And then trouble the master. If jumping out of this account in Luke 8, 49, 
Don't trouble the master. Well, trouble the master. Don't listen to that someone. Listen to Jesus. He wants you to trouble him. Trouble the master. Ask him. Come to him. Seek him. Knock on his door. Wait for his presence. He, he wants you to. Really? Yes. Even if you messed up. Really? Yep, yep. He is very merciful. God is very good. And thirdly, trust the master. This is the hard part. Because to trust the master for the things we can't even think about, the answers we can't conceive of, someone never thought Jesus could raise the daughter. Nor did the crowd. Nor did anybody except Jesus. That's where faith comes in. Jesus, I don't know how you're going to answer this one, but I trust you. I trust you. Jesus can always do something. Jesus can always do something. If you take a few words with you today, take those words. Jesus can always do something. Always. I'll close with this story. Bob and Susan Noble had a baby in March of 1980. That's why, Charlene, I'm thinking about the 80s already. Got a story out of the 80s. And little Nicolette Noble is born. They called her Coley for, for Nicole, short for Nicole. Little Coley cries, and little Coley eats, and little Coley looks at him and loves him like babies do, and they melt our hearts. Although they can be schoolo sometime, they can trouble you to the end of your wits. Have you ever had a baby trouble you to the end of your wits? I'm giving you back. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. But they, they know how. Coley started to move and everything and grow, and, and then they'd bring her to church or bring her places, and other babies would make noises, little cooing or sounds or hums and they noticed that Coley didn't make a sound. Never made a sound. That began to trouble Bob and Susan. So they took her to the doctor. Is there anything wrong with our daughter? She looks fine, but she doesn't make any noise. And the pediatrician examined her and determined that she was deaf. She never heard a word they said. Wow, she's never going to hear our voice. She's never going to hear her friends. Will she ever have any friends? She's going to be different than everybody. But then they didn't drift from Jesus. They, didn't, they, they went to him. And they committed to taking care of Coley, whatever. We're, we want her to do as much as she can do in her condition. We don't want to hold her back. We don't want to baby her. We want her to do as much as she can do. And, and we'll learn sign language, and she can learn sign language, and we'll, and we'll communicate. And they, they turned to the positive on it. When Coley was five years old, she's at the playground playing, and she doesn't know she's any different. She signs to a girl, Do you want to play with my dolly? The girl looks at her like, and so Coley's a little confused. Didn't you understand me? So she signs again. Do you want to play? Do you want to play with my doll? And the girl looks at her. That's weird. What, what are you doing? And laughs and runs away. And Coley realizes something's up. She goes to her mother, and her mother saw the whole thing. And you know, our hearts sink when our children are mistreated. And Coley comes to her mom, and they sign, and they talk. The next time at the playground, Coley doesn't play with the other children. She plays near them, but she does not ask any of them if they want to play. She stays in her own world. Bob and Sue see this, and, oh, Lord, we need, we need your help. Coley needs a friend, someone she can play with. All the children love to play together. So they pray and they ask for a special friend for Coley. She begins school. In that day, she went to a school for disabled children. Today, they're more in the schools or mainstream. Back then, they were separated. 
And she goes to school and she comes home one day, bright-eyed, and she sits down with her mother and she point-blank signs to her, Mother, am I deaf? And Sue had to say, yes, you are. Well, that didn't stop Coley. She, 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 finally, she got it. She knew something was up, and that was it. Because the other kids at the school had other problems or talked about different things. So she went to school, and they were praying she would find a friend. And they're praying. As kids do, and particularly Coley, she's reading books by herself at home. And it's an animal book, and we love to read animal books. The kids love to see the animals. And she saw some kitties and she saw a white Persian kitty and fell in love with it. So she brought the book to her parents and hold it, held it up to them, and they knew. And of course, she signed to them whatever the sign is for, oh, I, would, I want a kitty. And kids love to have pets. Well, it, they talked that might be good for her to have a pet. But Persian kitties, they're not cheap. We'll have to save our money. Bob was a school teacher and Sue worked at the school some. We'll have to save. And so they did. They committed to saving their money. It approached Coley's sixth birthday. Now, if you've seen a six-year-old lately, they run, they jump, they know, they know. They are little adults. Coley knows. And she's looking forward to a, a white Persian kitty for her birthday. So, Mom, are we going to get a kitty? Are we going to get a kitty? Let me call, or let me look. She looks in the newspaper. There's no Facebook back then. You have to look in the newspaper in the classifieds. Up to that point, there was nothing, but that week before her birthday, there it is, Persian kitties. New litter. Call Maria. Gives a number. White kitties. So Sue calls her. Hello, is this Maria? Yes, this is Maria. Maria... We're interested in your kitties that you have. Oh, wonderful. I've, do you have any left? Yes, I have two. I have two kitties left, and they're white and gray. Oh, we were hoping for one that was all white. I do have an all white one. The white and gray ones, they cost $200 each. I can sell you the white one for 50 why? Why? She's deaf. Mommy, can we bring her home? Can we bring her home? And Coley was tickled to death. She sat the cat on her bed and signed to the cat. Cat didn't understand sign yet, but she will, Mommy. She will. And God brought a special friend to Coley, and they were both deaf, and they had the greatest time. Jesus can always do something. We will not predict it, but he can always do something. 849, 849, 849, 850. If you won't be afraid, and if you'll trust him, he will do something beautiful. Karen, if you'll bring the music team, do you have a need? Is something inside you saying, now don't bother the master. Don't bother the pastor. Don't bother anybody. Just keep it to yourself. Something trying to pull you away from Jesus. Well, don't listen to that at all. Jesus wants you to trouble him. He wants you to come to him. He is open arms and full of power and abounding in love. That's the real Jesus. That's the one Satan doesn't want us to know about. The real Jesus never said, I can't do that. I can do all things. He said nothing's impossible. And Paul said, I can do all things through him. Do you have a need, a special need, a personal need? You want to trouble the master? I'd be happy to help you. And Claudette will come trouble him, and Becky will help come trouble him with you. Jesus is open.
always do something. Church, this month, yes, we've got a super Sunday in two weeks. We're going to have a campfire and testimonies, big inflatables, good food, and a great time. But in one week, we're going to have a worship service. It's all music and with the opportunity for discernment and healing prayer where we ask Jesus to heal. My own Julie caught on that maybe we should ask Marcus to come to that service. Oh, yes. And others. Don't let anyone tell you not to trouble the Master. Oh, no. Come and trouble Him. Trouble Him. Jesus can always do something. I, if you get a little bit down, just start saying that. I tested it this week. Judy, I had to test it before I preach it to you. Jesus can always do something. I tell you, all the unbelief garbage just falls away. It can't stand up to that because Jesus proved it. He brought Jairus in and raised his daughter from the dead. It wasn't a theory. It was proof. And Luke wrote it as a testimony. We're not talking about Jesus who might be able to help. We're talking about Jesus who always helps. Wow. I'm just getting warmed up. Sam, take over. What's the next message? What's Luke 8.51 and carry on? Let's go. Church, take, look at 8.49, but take 8.50 with you. Let's sing our closing song and have our closing prayer. Let's stand together and sing because he lives. bow our heads in prayer. Our dear precious Heavenly Father, as we go our separate ways today, please give us the courage and the hope and the strength 
to endure whatever the day might bring to us. But please, may we always hold dear to our hearts the power in your name. Just speaking Jesus is enough because you know us. And may we always be an example. Be a light when there's no light in darkness. And we always call on you, Jesus. And when trouble comes, and trouble will come, we never know whether in daylight, darkness, morning, noon, and night, God, you are present. All we have to do is call on you. Please, may we always know this. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.